Good morning, fourth year classes, students. Uh, this is your second lecture in literary criticism. So after we had, uh, let's say, a brief idea about Sir Philip Sidney and his critical theory, remember we said that he was the first one to introduce criticism into the English literature. He was the first one to start uh, English criticism. Now let's see another English critic. You, you see now we are moving to the English literature. Before that, in the classical period, we studied Plato, Aristotle, Horace, uh, even in the Middle Ages when we studied Dante. All of these critics, they were from the outside of the English literature. They were from other cultures. Um, now we will see that how the English poets, writers uh, like Sir Philip Sidney, like John Dryden, and then we are going to see also uh, Alexander Pope, how they introduced uh, the literary uh, criticism in English. What is the English criticism? Now we are uh, moving into uh, the English literature which sounds more familiar to us than other literatures. So John Dryden, okay, so what do we need to know about John Dryden? Uh, first of all, he was Poet Laureate. Poet Laureate, this is, uh, let's say, a title which is given to a certain poet. Uh, for example, we have Wordsworth uh, was a Poet Laureate. We have Tennyson was a Poet Laureate. And here we have John Dryden also a Poet Laureate. يعني بالعربي يسمونه شاعر البلاط البلاط الملكي This is a title which is given to a poet who is considered to be someone who can represent uh, or who can uh, uh, can have a voice he, he, he becomes the voice of poets uh, in the royal uh, let's say palace so he was one, one of the uh, poet laureates he is a dramatist uh, he is a playwright. He has actually written significant plays in the English literature and he was also a critic. He had certain contributions in criticism and these are uh, the contributions that we are going to highlight in our lecture. So first of all, let's see what is the book from which we are taking his literary uh, theory. His lasting contribution to literary criticism is his book, An Essay of Dramatic Poesy. So this is the title of the book, An Essay of Dramatic Poesy. Poesy is poetry, by the way. And notice here, dramatic poesy or dramatic poetry, if, we, if you want to pronounce it like this. Uh, so here you see we have a mixture of drama and poetry at the same time. Or we can say a drama which is written in verse. This is what we mean by dramatic poesy. Uh, Sir Philip Sidney, you, uh, you remember from the last time we said he was concerned more on poetry. He spoke about poetry. He defended poetry against accusations and he uh, gave us uh, forms of poetry. Now we see that um, here we have John Dryden. He's trying to combine these two uh, literary genre, uh, drama and poetry. So Dryden's critical work was extensive, treating of various genres such as epic, tragedy, comedy, and dramatic theory. So he was actually, um, and we call it in prolific. He wrote poems, he wrote uh, plays, uh, he even wrote about uh, different uh, theories concerning each art alone. You see, so uh, he's a really important figure in the history of English criticism. Now let's see his book. His book is really interesting, which is called, we say, An Essay of Dramatic Posey. This book has a certain structure which is actually uh, more of a dramatic structure. So he is he's trying to show uh, his literary theory through using drama, through a dramatic structure. So what is the structure of this book or what is so special about the uh, structure of uh, an essay of dramatic posey? Notice here, during the naval battle between the English and the Dutch. 
سوري سو هير يعني هنا كانه ما ادري ينطينا مثل القصه يعني دي خلينا نقول يعرض ويستعرض الافكار او النظريات بس من خلال قصه خلينا نقول او طريقه دراميه دراماتيك way or a dramatic manner so what do we have here we have uh, there was kind of an, uh, a battle a naval battle and we have those four men on a floating barge on the Thames River so these four men they were discussing uh, something here what is this thing they were discussing a group of aesthetic theories each supporting a different theory so he's trying to show the different theories not just by uh, listing these theories he's showing us these theories by making uh, uh, characters each one of them is speaking on the behalf of a certain theory each one of them is defending or supporting a certain aesthetic theory okay or we can say critical theory also and these theories actually where do they come from they are the theories that we have already studied in from the previous periods from the classical from the new classical from the renaissance uh, we see that now he's going to bring all these theories together and create a kind of a discussion or a debate between uh, different speakers who defend or support these theories Okay, so this is so this is how the uh, book is structured. This book. So if we go into more details about the debates, يعني النقاشات الموجودة داخل هذا الكتاب, the debate begins with the Platonic and Aristotelian concept of art as imitation. هم رجعنا من جديد إلى هاي الفكرة إذا تلاحظون هي بعدها لحد الآن مستمرة ويانا يعني من بداية ما شرحنا النقد من أفلاطون إلى الآن still we are talking about art as imitation يعني هم فكرة كلش كانت يعني مسيطرة على النقاد والأدباء so the, the first concept the first idea in the debate is we have this idea or this concept that art is an imitation this is something that we agree on one of the characters or we can say the debaters what did he say he said he argues that nature must be imitated directly so as writers as poets as playwrights why should we uh, imitate other poets we can look directly at nature we can look at different things around us and we can create stories about these things we can uh, be creative a writer or a poet can be creative by himself through looking at nature and trying to imitate nature to create stories based on what he sees uh, or experience in nature اذا واحد بيكم شاطر ممكن يعني يعرف هذا الراي المن المن شان يا واحد من النقاد اللي احنا درسناهم so who was the one who defended this that we should imitate nature Another debater declares that writers should imitate the classical authors such as Homer because they were the best imitators of nature, the best imitators. While the other one, uh, the other debater has another idea, let's say, which is different and it says that writers can't be creative and original by themselves. They have to take the example of the let's say the classical authors Homer for example because they have written the best literature they are the best imitators and be, to become good imitators we have to follow them classical period who's the one who supported this you are familiar with these uh, uh, let's say uh, opinions انتوا درستوهن فالمفروض هسه تعرفون كل رأي منو كان صاحب هذا الرأي. Other concerns uh, so the book also contains other let's say ideas other concepts هنا احنا نسميها concerns so what are they here we have four of them four you see one two three four the first one يعني هاي بعض المسائل الأخرى أيضا الموجودة بالكتاب 
The first one is related to language. The language or diction of a play with the concluding emphasis being placed on proper speech. What does this mean? Uh, it means that the, the, poet, the, sorry, the playwright should choose proper language. He should not, for example, uh, use uh, uh, swearing, for example, uh, obscene words, words uh, which can speak, let's say, about, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, bad words, uh, words which uh, refers to violence or such things. يعني خلينا نقول اللغة البذيئة يعني كانت مرفوضة الكاتب المسرحي المفروض ما يتكلم أو ما يستخدم لغة على لسان الشخصيات تكون لغة بذي بذيئة وغير مقبولة في المجتمع. Proper speech. Okay. <coughs> Number two issues of decorum that is whether violent acts should appear. On the stage. So again, if, if for example, if you wrote a play, uh, and in the play you have a scene of, let's say, fighting, uh, maybe battle, maybe two armies uh, fighting, uh, maybe someone is torturing another one. So you should avoid such scenes. العنف مشاهد العنف كانت أيضا مرفوض. Uh, so, with the final speaker declaring it would be quite improper. So, uh, so if, if acting violent scenes is forbidden, how can I say or how can I show the audience that there is a battle here happening? It should be reported by the characters or sometimes by the chorus, but not acted in front of the audience because it could uh, has sorry it could have um, a very bad or negative influence on them number three the differences between the english and the french theaters with the english drama winning out for its diversity its use of the stage and its shakespearean tradition okay so what does this mean here he is making uh, so another one of the issues that you find in the book uh, is the comparison between the English and the French theatres uh, which which one is the best according to Dryden of course he's English so he's going to say that the English theatre is better than the French but wha what makes uh, the English theatre better according to Dryden we have three elements here uh, because the English drama is known for what for its diversity you see it is known for its diversity its use of the stage so you see actually the uh, the, the writers such as for example Shakespeare Shakespeare was known to be uh, not only a writer not, not only a playwright he was also uh, an actor you see they, they emphasize or they uh, focus on having the stage يعني كان المسرح الإنجليزي خلينا نقول مسرح تمثيلي استعراضي أكثر مو مجرد مسرحيات تكتب وتقرأ يعني and it's Shakespearean tradition and who's the most famous uh, who's the most famous playwright in the world not only in the English literature uh, it is Shakespeare of course and he has uh, he has written, I think, the best, the best drama so far in English uh, literature. He's very famous. So uh, the, the English, according to, uh, according to Dryden, English theaters are better than the French because of these three qualities. Number four, the value of rhymed as opposed to blank verse in the drama, with the rhymed verse being the victor. Although Dryden later recanted this position and wrote many of his tragedies <clears throat> in blank uh, verse. Of course, you know that, some, yeah, that uh, in drama, if you, you studied, I think, uh, when you studied Shakespeare, when you studied Marlowe, you notice that they write the, the, the dialogues or let's say uh, the characters speak uh, in verse. They don't speak just this usual normal talk, 
of ordinary daily life speech. They use verse. So what did Dryden say? He said that uh, in real life, we don't talk like this. People don't talk uh, in verse or in rhyming. People talk normally. So how can we um, represent characters who are speaking uh, in verse uh, while in real life we don't have such a thing? We are not representing real life when we, do, we are doing this. Uh, but he later on he used the blank verse just in tragedies. You see, he believes that if it is in tragedies, it's okay to use the verse because it is the, the tragedy uh, deals with more serious subjects, not like, for example, the comedy. Okay, so, so what about Dryden's attitude? What does he has to say in this debate? So everyone, we have different characters, each one speaking a different theory. theory. What about Dryden? What is his attitude? Let, let's say. Neander, this, this is a character, Neander, the name of the debater, is a spokesperson of, spokesperson of Dryden. So the character which represents Dryden in the book is called Neander. So let's see what does this character say. Neander speaks in favor of the moderns and respects the ancients. So uh, Neander, what does he do when he listens to the different theories? Uh, he listens to the one who says that we should imitate nature and then he listens to the other one who says that we should imitate other writers. Uh, he listens to the one who says that uh, drama should be written uh, in verse. Uh, he listens to all the different theories and opinions and at the end what does he do? He tries to gather all these or combine all these opinions in just one opinion. He tries to show that we have, for example, to follow the ancients, we have to respect them, but at the same time we have to come up with something uh, original or creative. So he tries to, uh, uh, let's say, combine or gather all the opinions and try to come up with a new one. So he is, however, critical of the rigid rules of the dramas. You remember the rule of drama, I think you are now very familiar with it, which says that the, the playwright should follow the unities of time, place and action. So here, uh, Neander, who speaks for Dryden, what does he say about these rules? He said we should not actually follow them all the time. And favors using crime in serious drama, tragedy only, you see? He argues that tragic comedy is the best form for a play. See, tragic comedy, it is a combination of both. So sometimes in the tragedies you find we have comic scenes, comic relief. So this is the best form according to Dryden because it is closer to life because in life we have both. We have tragedies, we have comedies, we have sad moments, we have happy moments. He also finds subplots as an integral part to enrich a play. So not just focus on one action, we can add other actions, subplots. Why just to stick to one action from the beginning till the end? We can add uh, other storylines in the play. So finally, what is the attitude of Dryden? Dryden compromise. لاحظوا هاي الكلمة كلش مهمة. يعني يخلق نوع من التسوية. Compromise the two positions, showing the benefits of each position. يعني هو يحاول يظهر خلينا نقول الجوانب ال So thank you for listening. See you in the next lecture by God's will. Thank you.